Okay, Jesse, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and take it away. Thank you, Karen. Hello and welcome everybody to Matico's continuing webinar series. Thank you so much for attending our online training. I'm Jesse Manship, Technical Services Engineer with Matico. Matico's Technical Services Department is here to support our dealers, their customers, and our Matico sales team. We offer support on commercial solar and safety jobs, answer questions on a variety of topics about our films, glass, our warranty, energy analysis, and film to glass compatibility. Further information is available on our website. We also have Matico's technical resources at MaticoU, matico.com slash MaticoU, or by following matico.com and clicking in the upper bar. Technical resources are just one part of MaticoU. We have resources in film benefits, a glossary of terms, and film facts. In addition, we have product training videos. Matica U has a huge amount of information for you to learn. This is a list of some information on Matica U, a glossary of solar optical properties, some of which we'll discuss today, tools, installation instructions and tips, and then also frequently asked questions. Today, we're gonna to learn about UV radiation, the hazards of UV radiation, some statistics about skin cancer, and then the Skin Cancer Foundation's recommendations. After we talk about that, I'm going to review some solar optical properties and the nuances between these measures. Ultraviolet light is invisible light that has a shorter wavelength than visible light, but longer than X-rays. UV rays are part of the electromagnetic spectrum emitted by the sun. The sun emits three types of ultraviolet light or radiation, UVA, UVB, and UVC. UVC radiation is blocked by our ozone layer. UVB is partially blocked by the ozone layer. Both UVA and UVB reach the Earth's surface and can penetrate our skin. UVB rays have a shorter wavelength that reaches the outer layer of your skin called the epidermis, and UVA rays have a longer wavelength that can penetrate the middle of the skin called the dermis. So now I'm gonna try the polling. We're gonna do the first poll and question session right now. And uh, the goal with these is just to, to get you something to think about, and then also maybe spur some conversation at the end. Um, we're going to give about 30 seconds to 45 seconds for everyone to answer. You should see the poll on your screen now. If not, please remember that you can hover over the top and then click polls to open it up. Okay, um, thank you for those who participated. So for the first question, what is the difference between UVA and UVB rays? Uh, the next slide I'm going to go into some differences and some um, some statistics about it. So basically the answer for this one is all of the above and uh, I'll explain in a moment. And then for the second one, which components make up a complete skin cancer prevention strategy? Again, here the answer is all of the above. So you want sunblock, protective clothing, window film, and outdoor shading. So when it comes to skin cancer, a major risk factor is prolonged exposure to ultraviolet radiation. UV radiation is part of the natural energy produced by the sun. On the electromagnetic spectrum, UV light has a shorter wavelength than visible light, so your eyes cannot see UV, but your skin can feel it. Two types of UV light are proven to contribute to the risk for skin cancer. Ultraviolet A, or UVA, has a longer wavelength and is associated with skin aging. Ultraviolet B, or UVB, has a shorter wavelength and is associated with skin burning. While UVA and UVB rays differ in how they affect your skin, they both do harm. Unprotected exposure to UVA and UVB damages the DNA in your skin cells. This can produce genetic defects or mutations, which can lead to skin cancer. UVB penetrates and damages the outermost layers of your skin. Overexposure causes suntan, sunburn, and in severe cases, blistering. UVB's intensity fluctuates. 
The sun's rays are strongest and pose the highest risk late to mid-morning to mid-afternoon in the spring and to fall, excuse me, from spring to fall in temperate climates and even greater time spans in tropical climates. UVA rays, while slightly less intense than UVB, penetrate your skin more deeply. Exposure causes genetic damage to cells on the innermost part of the top layer of your skin. This is where most skin cancers occur. UVA is everywhere. UVA accounts for 95% of the UV radiation reaching the Earth. These rays maintain the same level of strength during all daylight hours throughout the whole year, as opposed to UVB, which was just from the spring to the summer, or excuse me, from the spring to the fall. Skin cancer is an out of control growth of abnormal cells in the epidermis. This is the outermost skin layer. It's caused by unrepaired DNA damage that triggers mutations. These mutations need the skin cells to multiply rapidly and form malignant tumors. The main types of skin cancer are basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, melanoma, Merkel cell carcinoma. The two main causes of skin cancer are the sun's harmful ultraviolet rays and the use of UV tanning machines. In the United States, more than 9,500 people are diagnosed with skin cancer every day. More than two people die of the disease every hour. More people are diagnosed with skin cancer each year in the United States than every other cancer combined. At least one in five Americans will develop this by the age of 70. So now I'm gonna do poll two. So while you're taking part of this poll, here's some additional facts and figures from the Skin Cancer Foundation. About 90% of non-melanoma skin cancers are associated with the exposure of ultraviolet radiation from the sun. The latest figures suggest that more than 15,000 people die of squamous cell carcinoma of the skin in the, in the United States every year. That's more than twice as many from melanoma. More than 5,400 people die worldwide of non-melanoma skin cancer every month. Regular daily use of an SPF 15 or higher sunscreen reduces the risk of developing squamous cell carcinoma by about 40%. Okay, so everybody should see the results of those polls. Um, the first one was asking, has anybody ever asked you about window film and preventing skin cancer? And the majority of you said yes on that. Um, and I get those kind of questions as well. And the second question is, what kind of tools are you currently using to demonstrate solar copies of window film? And a lot of you have selected a sample of the architectural film. And um, that's a very good one because it does have all of our specs on it if you look at our design guides. Um, so we're going to go on to the next slide here. Oops. Excuse me, guys. My hole got stuck in the middle there. So for over 40 years, the Skin Cancer Foundation's initiative, leadership, education, and programs have opened people's eyes, led to change, and saved lives. Skin cancer takes decades to develop, and cases are still on the rise. We have much more work to do until we can eliminate deaths and ease suffering caused by the world's most common cancer. Supporting the Skin Cancer Foundation by committed corporations can help us reach that goal. Matico has been awarded the seal of recommendation by the Skin Cancer Foundation for its automotive, architectural, and safety and security window films. These block 99% or more of the UVA and UVB radiation. The Skin Cancer Foundation has set the standard for educating the public and the medical community about skin cancer, its prevention by means of sun protection, and the need for early detection and prompt effective treatment. Matico is proud to have its solar control window films recommended by the Skin Cancer Foundation as part of our complete skin care prevention strategy. Matico's solar control window films offer a wealth of benefits to individuals driving or riding in a car, relaxing at home, or working in an office. Besides providing cooler, comfortable interiors and reducing glare, 
Most importantly, Matico's window films block 99% of the sun's harmful ultraviolet rays, offering necessary skin protection. Our automotive, solar control, and safety window films block the sun's UV rays, providing full coverage and acting as a sunscreen. The next topic I'd like to cover is solar optical properties of films. On the left is a list of common solar optical properties reported on Matico's automotive and architectural films. We just discussed UV blocking, but our films also limit visible and infrared light. Before we get into each of these terms, it's important to visualize the different types of light so we can relate those back to the terms. This illustration outlines the bulk of the electromagnetic spectrum. Shorter wavelengths are to the left and longer wavelengths are to the right. Reading from left to right, we begin with gamma rays. These are the types of radiation that can kill you. Then X-rays, ultraviolet radiation, visible light, near infrared. As the spectrum continues, the wavelengths increase all the way up to radio frequencies. The areas of interest to us and that we can affect with our films are UV, visible, and infrared. Solar gain from UV light is minimal, counting for only 3% of the heat. Visible light is responsible for 44% of the heat, while near infrared is responsible for 53% of the heat gain. Total solar energy is the total solar energy reaching the Earth. It consists of 3% UV rays from 300 to 380 nanometers, 44% visible light from 380 to 780 nanometers, and 53% infrared rays from 780 to 2500 nanometers. This is the main source of heat. As we just saw, UV, visible, and IR are all types of light within the solar spectrum. Each of these types of light, UV, visible, and IR, are either transmitted, reflected, or absorbed by the window film and glass. For transmission, the lower the number, the less the light is, or the less light is being transmitted. A perfect example to visualize this is visible light transmitted. The lower percentage of visible light results in a darker window. The higher the number, the more visible light is being transmitted, resulting in a brighter window. For reflected, the higher the percentage, the more mirror light while the lower, the closer to how normal glass appears. Absorbed percent is most closely to how hot the glass will feel to the touch. A high absorbing autofilm will make the glass feel hotter in the sun than a highly reflected architectural film. Poll three, please. Okay. So these two questions, the first one was total solar energy is the energy that reaches a window, including UV, visible, and IR. So remember, the heat that you're feeling from the sun is from all three types of light. So ultraviolet light accounts for about 3% of that heat that you feel. Visible light is about 44% of that heat that you feel. And infrared rays are about 53% of that heat that you feel. And then the second question was asking if customers have ever asked you about this. It's about a 50-50 split. Um, I get a lot of questions about this, but it doesn't mean that everybody does, obviously. Uh, thank you guys for participating. We're going to go to the next slide here. Okay, so now we're going to go into it a little bit more detail on different types of light. So infrared light is light that has a wavelength greater than red, the red light that you can see. Infrared light is invisible to your eyes. With this type of light, windows and window films are concerned with the wavelengths that range from 780 nanometers to 25,000 nanometers. The near IR is between 780 and 2,500 nanometers, while the far IR is between 2,500 and 25,000 nanometers. Near IR is the heat that you feel from the sun, while the far IR is the heat that you feel from an object a fire or a stovetop. Near IR is measured and reported as IR rejection, measured from 780 to 2500, and far IR is measured and reported as emissivity, measured from 2500 to 25,000 nanometers. 
Visible light is part of the spectrum that our eyes can see. Light is an electromagnetic wave, and its color depends on its wavelength. Like all waves, it has different wavelengths that give it its color when we talk about colors to our visible eyes. Excuse me, to our eyes. When the wavelengths are short, around 380 nanometers, we perceive them as blue or violets. And when they're longer, around 700 nanometers, we perceive them as reds. The typical eye can see, wa see, see wavelengths from 380 nanometers to 780 nanometers. Just a quick review on UV light. Um, so UV light is invisible. It has a shorter wavelength than visible light, but longer than x-rays. The sun emits three types of light or radiation, UVA, UVB, and UVC. UVC is blocked by the ozone layer. UVB is partially blocked by the ozone layer. Both UVA and B reach the Earth's surface and can penetrate our skin. UVB rays are a short, shorter wavelength and reach the outer layer of your skin, while UVA rays have longer wavelengths and can penetrate deeper into the middle layers of your skin. Solar heat gain coefficient, shading coefficient, luminous efficacy, U factor. These are all calculations of the window's performance based on the measurements that we take when we measure the light that either transmits, reflects, or absorbs through the filmed glass. Some of these measures are similar in type, but each gives us a different meaning of how films and windows perform. We get a little deeper into the properties now. So solar heat gain coefficient is a fraction of the solar radiation emitted through a window, door, or skylight. It's either transmitted directly or absorbed and radiated in. The lower the solar heat gain coefficient, the less solar heat is transmitted and the greater the performance. The solar heat gain coefficient is a ratio from zero to one. Solar heat gain coefficient of zero means none of the incident solar gain is transmitted through the window as heat. A solar heat gain coefficient of one means all of the solar energy is transmitted through the window as heat. A window with a solar heat gain coefficient of 0.6 will emit twice as much solar heat gain as one with a solar heat gain coefficient of 0.3. So this means that we can calculate how much energy is rejected. The total solar energy rejected is calculated from the solar heat gain coefficient. Since solar heat gain coefficient is the fraction that's admitted into the, through the window, TSER is the fraction that's rejected by the window. Adding these two numbers together will give you a total of one. So a quick calculation would be a TSER of 10% would be a solar heat gain coefficient of 0.9. Similarly, a TSER of 90% would mean a solar heat gain coefficient of 0.1. Now, shading coefficient is very similar to solar heat gain, but there's some differences. So shading coefficient is a measure of the thermal performance of a glass unit. It's the ratio of solar gain due to direct sunlight passing through a glass unit to the solar energy which passes through a normal, four, excuse me, one eighth inch thick clear float glass. So what's the difference between solar heat gain coefficient and shading coefficient? The solar heat gain coefficient is the percentage of solar energy incident on the glass that's transmitted indoors, both directly and indirectly through the glass. The shading coefficient is a measure of heat gain through the glass from solar radiation. It does not account for absorption and re-radiation. Both measures measure heat transfer through the window, but slightly differently. Um, now it's time for question or poll four. Okay, I think that's good. Okay, so both of these are designed to get you thinking a little bit more. So solar heat gain coefficient can, can be used in comparing um, automotive films as well as flat gas films. Um, it's just designed to get you thinking about how much heat is coming through the film glass. So it's a very good comparison um, if you're comparing uh, films along the, in the Matico series or comparing Matico to a, a competitor's products. If you're looking at solar heat gain coefficient, that's a measure of how much heat 
It's gonna come in through that glass once you use the film. And then the second question is, why, why is solar heat gain coefficient a better indicator of heat rejection over IR? I'm gonna go into more detail on, in, in this on a moment, but um, the main point to remember is that heat alone is not just IR, okay? So the answer here would have been all of the above. Okay, um, the next two numbers I'm gonna talk about have to deal with spectrally selective glazing. And the first one is luminous efficacy. Uh, this is the glazing window film industry to measure the amount of visible light as a ratio to the shading coefficient. This ratio is known as luminous efficacy, or LE. And it helps determine how much solar energy is transmitted through the glass that is visible light versus solar heat. Like the solar heat gain is very similar, this is the ratio of visible light to the solar heat gain coefficient of the glass. And in absolute percentage terms, a ratio greater than one signifies that daylight passing through the glass is more than the sun's direct heat passing through it. This ratio provides a gauge of the relative efficiency of different glass types in transmitting daylight while blocking heat gains. The higher the LSG, the brighter the room is without adding excessive amounts of heat. Spectrally selective glazings are high performance glazings that emit as much daylight as possible while preventing the transmission of as much solar heat gain as possible. Spectrally selective glazing significantly reduces a building's energy consumption by controlling solar heat gains in the summer, preventing loss of interior heat in the winter, and allowing occupancy to reduce electric lights, <coughs> excuse me, to reduce electric lighting by, by making maximum use of natural daylight. A light to solar heat gain ratio greater than one is a spectrally select product. However, generally that ratio needs to be 1.2 or higher to be classified as a spectrally selective glazing. The Department of Energy defines spectrally selective as a coating that is optically designed to reflect or reject particular wavelengths, but remain transparent to others. Such coatings are commonly used to reflect the infrared portion of the solar spectrum while emitting more visible light. They help create a window with a low solar heat gain coefficient but a high visible light transmission. <clears throat> now I'm gonna get into IR. Um, that was a part of our questions for our last polling. So the percent IR rejection is the total amount of infrared rays rejected by the window film and glass. The higher the number, the higher the infrared rays rejected. Matico measures over the entire IR spectrum from 780 nanometers to 2,500 nanometers. Most window foam companies only display the near infrared in a narrow wavelength, from 900 to 1,000, for example. This can give misleading data of 99% IR rejection. I urge you to ask for the complete wavelength distribution of their, for their IR rejection. IRER is a new value that was developed by the IWFA to better stand for the amount of IR that is blocked by window foam. IRER accounts for the part of the IR that is absorbed into the glass and radiated inwards, heating the room of the vehicle. It measures across the entire IR region from 780 to 2,500 nanometers. So what's the difference between IR rejection and IRER? So IR rejection is the amount of IR that's not transmitted through the glass. IR rejection is one of the most confusing terms for consumers and dealers. Since there's no uniform method to measure this value, it's reported however the manufacturer chooses. Some manufacturers, like Matico, measure the entire IR region from 780 to 2500, while others only measure a narrow region from 900 to 1000 or a single wavelength at 1400. Measuring a narrow region does not show the true level of IR rejection. However, since there's no standard, there is no right way. IRER is a new value that IWA, IWFA developed to unify the way that IR is discussed by window film manufacturers. IRER measures the amount of IR energy transmitted through and the amount radiated from the window over the full IR spectrum from 780 to 2500 nanometers. It's, the mo it's most like TSER, 
since IRER measures transmitted and radiated energy. It is a more complete measure of the IR energy that passes through a window because of the sun. The U factor measures the rate of heat transfer through a product. Thus its rating shows us how well a window insulates. This measurement stands for both heat loss during cold weather and heat gain during warm weather. U factor considers conductance, airflow, and heat radiation or reflection of the glass. Emissivity is a measure of an object's ability to emit infrared radiation. Emitted energy indicates the temperature of an object. Emissivity can have a value of zero, like a shiny mirror, or one, like a black body or a completely absorbing object. Low E or low emissivity glass was created to minimize the amount of infrared energy that escapes through your window in the wintertime without minimizing the amount of heat that enters from the sun into your home through the window. Modern low E glass comes in many types, including solar control versions that will limit the amount of heat coming in from the sun. So, and lastly, since UV is often associated with fading, I think it's good to discuss it here. Customers often ask me, what's the best way for film to stop fading? Well, there's no film that will stop fading. We can slow fading though. To effectively control it, it's important to control not only the UV light, but to control some amount of visible light and infrared heat. If you were to block out all of the UV light, you're only blocking 40% of the cause of fading. If you blocked out all the ultraviolet, all the visible, and all the near infrared, you'd still only block out 90% <clears throat> and you'd be in the dark. In comparison, if you controlled all the UV and 50% of the visible light and 50% of the infrared, you control about 65% of the cause of fading. Window film reduces fading from exterior sunlight. However, it does not completely eliminate fading, as no window film does. By choosing the right window film for the situation, you can greatly reduce harmful solar rays and prolong the appearance of va and value of furnishing fabrics and finishes. So conclude today's uh, Matico uh, webinar. Do we have any questions? Okay, Jesse, it doesn't look like we're getting any questions. So I appreciate everybody attending today. I do as well. Thank you everybody for attending. Um, as always, you can reach out directly to me if you have any questions and you'd like to discuss them in more details. Thank you. Thanks, Jesse. Thank you.